Hey commanders, check this out. The Beluga Liner. This will be the last of my exploration series and I wanted to save this for last specifically because it's kind of an odd little duckling. The Saud Kruger ships used to be crap for everything but passenger missions, but an update I think about a year ago made it so that some of these optional internal slots that used to be restricted to passenger cabins only could now be used for anything. And that really brought these ships to life. Any of the Saud Kruger ships make for competent explorers, and from an aesthetic role-playing standpoint, these ships make a lot of sense as exploration vessels because they're supposed to offer their crews a greater degree of comfort. They look like something that's meant to be out in the deep dark. And some of their core internals actually reflect that fairly well. In the Beluga's case, we have lightweight alloy, heavy-duty grade 5, and deep plating, which is what most exploration ships will use. The 6A power plant with low emissions grade 5 and thermal spread. Because of the way the Beluga works when it comes to power consumption, I don't recommend undersizing this power plant. 7D thrusters, dirty grade 5, drag drives. These can be undersized if you choose. I've elected not to on this build because I find that the Beluga just kind of handles a little bit better with the 7s rather than the 6s. And it has an impressive amount of speed even with the D-rated thrusters on it, boosting to 410 with a speed of 293. 7A frame shift drive. This is a powerful piece of equipment that not very many ships in the game get to have. The larger frameshift drives get, the less of an impact each ton of mass that the drive has to haul will lower your jump range. So a 7A is going to be able to deal with weight a lot better than something like a 5A that you would find on a Crate Phantom. On Crate Phantoms, even a utility mount could potentially knock an entire light year off of your journey, depending on how it's fitted. So. Uh, when you get to go up to something like a 7A, you stop having to worry about that so much, and it's really liberating because it frees you up to run a lot heavier equipment that potentially consumes less power or gives you more functionality. It's for those reasons that this Beluga doesn't give a lot of considerations to how much things weigh, and is designed to be more fun to fly than it is to be very travel efficient. An 8A life support. For aesthetic role-playing purposes, this could easily be derated if you so chose. In either case, lightweight grade 5 is your best bet. 5D power distributor, engine focus grade 5, and flow control. Uh, this is because, again, the Beluga doesn't care about weight as much. You could make this smaller if you wanted to, but in the ship that I'm flying in game, I, like, I'm getting ready to re-engineer it to bring it closer in line with what I've got here. Um, but I have a pulse laser and some mine launchers and some other different things. The Beluga with a 5D distributor gets just enough flexibility that it can run power efficient hardpoints. 5A sensors, lightweight grade 5, um, I find to be very flexible. If you wanted to, you could elect for long range, which doubles your mass and it actually does, it's just heavy enough to knock an entire light year off of the uh, off of the jump range of your ship, which some commanders might be okay with. Uh, I'm agnostic on it. I tend to prefer the lightweight setup because it's an exploration ship. Uh, it's really your call there though. The 7C fuel tank is incredibly unique. No other ship in the game offers this much fuel capacity from the factory and that means that the Beluga has the ability to chain jumps together and run on the neutron highway without needing to mess with the optionals at all. It is a very powerful unique attribute and it is one that I leverage to its fullest effect, even at the cost that it imparts on jump range. And yes, the fuel mass is a significant cost. The weight of the fuel tank exceeds the weight of basically everything else in the optionals combined. It is a really important thing to leave on the ship if you want to use it to its fullest effect. Uh, if you want to jump for maximum range, the Anaconda is always going to be better. Because the Beluga is kind of capped at about... Like, I, I haven't seen very many people get them up over 60 light years. You have to make a lot of sacrifices that tend to make it less fun to fly and make the Anaconda a better choice. However, what a lot of people don't know about jump range is that once you cross the 50 light year threshold, you start really hitting diminishing returns. The amount of time you actually save with a 70 light year jump range compared to a 50 light year jump range isn't anywhere near as much as you save going from something like 20 light years to 50 light years. The travel efficiency of ships in exploration 
really starts to come into its own as you approach 50 light years. And after that, anything you can get better is just kind of a bonus. There aren't very many cases in Elite Dangerous where you absolutely have to have 70 light years to get things done. One of those cases is fringe exploration on the outer edge of the galaxy, something that a lot of explorers have done a pretty good job about. But if you're trying to make a lot of money, which is what the Beluga Liner is pointed more at, jump range does not matter as much as your capacity to stay out in the black for long periods of time and stay on task without needing to worry about resupply or distractions. 50 light years is plenty. And as I've used this ship for different exploration purposes, I've found myself completely satisfied with it, even running a 6A fuel scoop. One of the Beluga's disadvantages is it doesn't give you any opportunity for 7s. And that means that it also has the worst refuel scoop time in the game. 2 minutes and 25 seconds. It's even worse than the DBX. But, if you're smart about route planning, and you are exploring to make money, you're not as worried about the scoop time because you can do partial scans of systems while your fuel scoop is running near a star, and then reposition to scan the rest of the system, if you really needed to. But this refuel time is also a big part of the reason why you should not run anything but low emissions on a Beluga. It's one of the sacrifices you, ha you do have to make, but it's a sacrifice that pays itself off very well. Because the Beluga Liner is extremely good at riding the Neutron Highway. And with the right AFM, in this case a 5A, you've got plenty of ability to keep that frameshift drive chugging along and keep it working really well. Now, the 6H Planetary Vehicle Hanger and 60 fighter hangar are totally optional. You don't have to stick these on the ship if you don't want to, although I do recommend that you put a planetary vehicle hangar on here somewhere so that you can explore planet surfaces. These two things are on here because of Odyssey. Because we now know that we're going to have the ability to share SRVs, there is an incentive, especially on large ships, to run enough SRV bays so that everybody who could fit in a multi-crew session can potentially get their own SRV to use. I love that FDEV has finally come in and rebuilt the code behind this because it's going to make it really easy for explorers to bring friends along and potentially have uh, a lot of fun at Guardian sites or different surface ruins that we might get the opportunity to explore. The 60 fighter hangar is in here because even though the Beluga handles well, it's still fun to get into a small ship and it's nice to have something disposable you can use to poke anomalies or check different hazardous environments for threats. 60 shield generator enhanced low power grade 5 and low draw giving you just enough shields so that if you encounter something that likes to eat shields and there are some biological sites that will do this to you especially at Lagrange clouds uh, you have enough time to escape before you take hull damage not much you have to be paying attention but enough that you can manage threats at 148 megajoules of absolute shielding this should be considered more of a navigational shield than a defense against weapons fire it will accept incoming damage from things like guardian drones but if four or five of them start wailing on it at the same time, it's not going to last very long. And if the damage tables from Odyssey mean anything, um, a single guy with a pulse rifle is probably going to be able to chew this out pretty quickly. So I'm hoping that FDEV comes in and addresses that. A 5H Guardian frameshift drive booster for a free 10.5 light years of extra jump range. A no brainer for any large exploration ship. A 5A auto field maintenance unit. A 4E corrosion resistant cargo rack. You could easily swap this for a standard cargo rack, but 16 tons is usually enough storage for most exploration purposes. I have this outfitted as a corrosion resistant rack in the event that I end up somewhere out there where guardians or thargoids are out and where my cargo might potentially be corrosive. A 3D collector limpet controller. Lightweight grade 5. That's supposed to be 5. Uh, because the Beluga is big enough that it, trying to manually scoop is a bit of a chore and it's nice to have available in the event you find some debris out there or some different commodities that you scoop up uh, in space, especially around Guardian Beacons. 3D Repair Olympic Controller because we don't have quite enough hull for the 5 to be necessary, especially with 16 tons of potential Olympic capacity. 1E Research Limpet Controller for Lagrange Clouds and biological sites that might potentially yield commodities that are saleable. A 1I Detailed Surface Scanner, for obvious reasons, every exploration ship needs one. Engineered with the Probe Scanning Radius Blueprint to Grade 5. And a 1E Advanced Docking Computer, 
for a couple of reasons. The big one here is that the beluga's tail fins tend to get caught on the docking racks as you fly into a station's airlock. And it can be a little difficult to get unstuck once you get stuck. Uh, it's for that reason I recommend the advanced docking computer on the beluga specifically over the Super Cruise Assist module. Although if you felt like it and you were confident in your abilities you could easily put a Super Cruise Assist on there and have a bit of an easier time about things. But um, for the Beluga specifically, especially, like, I've, I've been playing this game forever, I find that the advanced docking computer is just the better way to deal with uh, docking at Coriolis stations. But if you know that you're not going to do that, and that you're going to farm up a whole bunch of exploration data and only ever dock at a fleet carrier, a Super Cruise Assist is probably going to be fine. And thankfully, you know, those are easy to swap out from storage if you happen to have fleet carrier access and change your mind at some point. Hard points. 2F pulse laser, lightweight grade 5 with flow control, which is for guardian beacons. Potentially you could do ground support with this if someone was at a guardian ruin and needed someone to help them blow up sentinels, but in that case the fighter hangar is probably the better, more fun choice anyway. Two heat sink launchers, each with ammo... Um, let's see. The heat sink launchers actually don't appear to be engineered. Um, you could go with ammo capacity here, or you could go with lightweight, but the amount of impact that these utilities have on your jump range is just so small that it's really up to you how you deal with it. I also have a Xeno scanner in the event I end up somewhere out where there are Thargoids that might not try to kill me, and I want to get data on them. A frame shift wake scanner, uh, so that I have something else that I could potentially play with. It's optional. Neither one of these two utilities are essential. You don't have to stick them on. You could replace them with anything, really. But the amount of jump range and power that they cost, especially deactivated, is so minimal that I just throw them on there for the hell of it. And then two point defenses, neither one of which are engineered in this blueprint, but any one of which could be engineered with lightweight or, well, it's a point defense. Lightweight's really the only thing relevant. Uh, unless you're building a combat ship, but this isn't one. So, uh, what do we have for power constraints? Uh, you do have to run with stuff disabled. The Beluga requires you to turn stuff off in order to run everything because the power plant's just not strong enough to do all the stuff you need to do all the time. So you do need to be familiar with how to set priorities and how to turn modules off. And you do need to be willing to part with 228 0.7 million credits, which isn't bad. The Beluga liner is actually cheaper than the Anaconda for just the haul. It's a lot of fun. It's something that you should consider um, if you want to do mainline exploration without needing to worry about time. If you leverage the neutron highways, the Beluga liner can still make a good pace across the galaxy, but it's not something that you're going to like as much if you're doing extreme fringe exploration. So just keep that in mind when you're sticking her together and uh, well, I think that's I think that's all I got for today. So I'll catch you guys later.